let's start with it. All right. Sounds good. Uh, thanks, Rahul, for the very generous uh, introduction. And hi, everyone. Um, so my objective here is to just talk a little bit about some of the related work that we've been doing. And my objective today is to have this be less of like a conference presentation, more of like a class. So I would like to talk, dive into more details of behind the scenes to help you guys out rather than like just think, stay at the high level and, and so on. So at any time, if you feel like uh, the, I'm not covering something in detail, you should just stop me and, and, uh, uh, and, and ask questions, okay? All right, so let's get started. So this work is actually the, the, the primary focus of what I'm gonna be talking about today is led by this uh, fantastic group of collaborators, uh, including Harish Karnan, who is a PhD student, uh, Kavan Sikhan is also a PhD student, Sadi Rabi is also a PhD student, Pranav is an undergrad, Adam um, is a staff member, Shuesu and Garrett are postdocs and researchers, and of course, you know, Peter Stone, right? So um, in my lab, which is called the Autonomous Mobile Robotics Laboratory, we pursue essentially four umbrellas of research, and today I'm going to be talking about work which is in the fourth umbrella, really. Uh, so before we get too uh, into that, I just want to give you a flavor of like what else we do. Okay, so uh, amongst the other things that we do, uh, we actually like deploying robots out in the real, real world, where our, our primary research, our interests are in like perception and in planning for long-term autonomy. And on the top right, you see essentially an autonomous uh, uh, robot. It's pulling a track uh, a tractor. And it's essentially doing mail delivery because our robotics building is in a different building from where we receive our packages. So it's actually pulling the packages for, which include parts for robots. And I particularly like that because it's robots helping us build robots. So that's fun. And we work with all kinds of platforms, including things like uh, custom indoor omnidirectional robots like the Cobot, uh, wheeled robots like the Jackal Outdoors and the Boston Dynamics Spot, right? And we work on lots of things related to this. So as a very quick overview, we look at how can you do long-term uh, perception? So we operate on, on the campus scale, but despite operating on the campus scale, something key to note here is that the, the map that the robots use are actually very sparse. So you see the blue lines are overlaid on the satellite image on the left. That's all that the robots have. And in real time, what the robots are doing is that they're reasoning about whether these observations uh, are long-term, whether they are actually short-term static objects, which it did not know about, shown in purple, and whether things are dynamic, uh, shown in green. And this allows a robot to actually be very robust in environments where you don't have like up-to-date maps all the time. So in fact, you can see like a person moving around uh, and that, that track is in green. When you're moving in the real world, there's like a lot of noise and bumpiness of like what the robot sees, which is why some of them are detected as, uh, as dynamic objects. But this is actually a, a real robot, robot log of the uh, uh, robot going from one building to another. This is what we call episodic non-Markov localization. That's essentially what my PhD thesis was on and it allowed these robots to be robust and reliable over extended periods of time without requiring accurate up-to-date maps. So some recent work which we've been doing with uh, another a PhD student, Amanda Atkins of mine and my group is, can we uh, infer probabilistic distributions of movable objects? And the idea here is that in human environments like this parking lot, the exact location of these parked cars is gonna change from day to day, right? However, you can actually infer a long-term distribution of the most likely places where these, uh, these uh, um, cars are likely to be. Can you use these probabilistic distributions and real-time uh, detections of cars to actually uh, do long-term localization? And the answer is yes, you can. And in fact, if you do that, you can even outperform things like Google Cartographer or Legolom. And the reason is that Cartographer and Legolom assume that the world is going to be static. And clearly, the world is not static. The parking lot is a very challenging environment where most of the observations when you're going between these cars are of movable objects, while our algorithm uh, shown on the leftmost is actually consistently able to track the robot's location. We've also looked at autonomous failure estimation, uh, failure detection and recovery. So uh, here's an example of visual SLAM. On the left is uh, what we call introspective vision for a SLAM. And on the right hand side is Orb SLAM, which is a, a very popular open source SLAM algorithm. And on the top, you see the images that are seen by this robot. So in a little bit, what's going to happen is that Orb Slam is going to fail, right? Whereas our algorithm is going to continue working. But just looking at the images, can any of you guess as to why it's going to fail and what the failure is going to be? Oh, uh, Rahul, I think you're muted. So maybe I won't be able to hear if anybody's answering. Yeah. 
Any thoughts? I think someone said something, but I didn't fully catch what we were saying. Is, no, they're asking is the question <laughs> that why is Obslam going to fail? Yeah, oh, why will it? What in the image are you looking at? Can you point out to something in the image which is unusual and will lead uh, to this uh, orb slam failing? Yeah, yeah. Come on. <laughs> There's a shadow on kind of the center of the image that looks like it's trying to crack. Yeah, it's the shadow. So, what's happening here, very correctly pointed out, is that this is a scenario where the, the sun is setting behind the robot. And as the robot's moving, the shadow is taking up a large part of the image. And what's happening is that the, the features, which are extracted from the corner of the image, are actually not going to move over time. And since the features are not moving, Orbslam is going to be fooled into believing that the robot stopped. Right. Um, so let me just uh, replay it. And essentially, this is the kind of scenario where our algorithm is automatically able to reject most of the bad features, is able to insert features from good regions. And for places where it's actually uncertain, it's actually able to account for predicted variance. And this allows uh, our algorithm to actually robustly keep tracking the robot motion, whereas Orbslam thinks that robot is stopped. Okay. So this is actually a line of work called competence aware uh, perception and planning. And uh, this, these things are really important when you deploy the robots in the real world, when uh, inevitably they will encounter unexpected uh, new ways of failing, which happens all the time as robots, as you probably know, right? Okay. Um, finally, the, the third umbrella of research that we have is in physics informed program synthesis, where we're trying to uh, uh, learn policies pi, which map from uh, states and previous actions to new actions for the next time step. And in particular, what we're looking at is that the state space is a continuous state space. So for example, you could have positions and velocities of humans, uh, states of nearby objects, local navigation goals, et cetera. And this policy pi is going to be a programmatic action selection policy, so uh, which is going to be synthesized by uh, the robot. And these actions are discrete low-level sk uh, skills. If you want to go into details about how we do this, this is like a topic for a different time. But I want to just uh, show you a couple of examples of synthesized policies. This is for robot soccer, where the robot's actually just trying to like intercept the ball and continuously score on the goal. It's actually very effective. Um, what's particularly nice about these programmatic policies is that they're very amenable to repair with, very, with small numbers of corrections. So for example, let's say you train the policy in simulation and you try to run around the real robot. The first time you ran from, uh, you do that, then of course things are going to not work very well. So here, what's happening is that the robot's able to intercept the ball, but for whatever reason, it's not kicking, right? Now, what's cool is that uh, using programmatic policies. So here's an example, a fragment of this programmatic policy. The way uh, we can actually do repairs is that we have an automated uh, program analysis, which takes this uh, program, it takes these corrections, and then what it does is that it hypothesizes for each parameter can you hypothesize corrections delta? And then we frame a SAT modular theory uh, problem, which says that do there exist adjustments delta such that the result of running this program is equal to the human correction? Okay. This is a SAT modular theory. And if the solution exists, you've found the uh, adjustment to your parameters. And it turns out that this is actually very effective with only a few corrections. You can correct your robots uh, robot behaviors and that thing which uh, was not working before can suddenly start shooting. So that should be quite effective. Okay. Okay. So this is a very whirlwind overview of like the, the three areas of research, which I'm not going to be talking about today, but I do want to talk about is, uh, you know, uh, the umbrella of research, which I, which I broadly call learning for navigation. Okay. Um, okay. So the first thing that I want to delve into is uh, we want to understand how uh, about kinodynamic models, okay? Now the question is, why should we care about kinodynamic models? I'm sure in your class, you've actually implemented uh, uh, controllers where you have a desired state for the, uh, the car to drive to, and you've written controllers where based on the state, you figure out what the command should be and you execute the command, okay? So let me uh, ask you this question. So under what circumstances will, will the command that you, try to execute on the car, not actually match what actually what the car actually ends up executing. Under what circumstances will there actually be a mismatch between the expectation and reality? Probably if, if you're asking for an input that the car itself can't, can't uh, handle. 
Okay, so that's a good one. So you're applying, you're asking the car to do something which it cannot do. And an excellent example of that is, let's say the car is stopped and you say in the next time step, you have to be going 10 meters per second. Um, if you have a, a competition regulation motor on your car, then you probably can't do uh, 10 meters per second in one uh, frame period. Even if you did, I don't think you can have the uh, enough traction. You can't generate enough traction to be able to accelerate at that uh, ludicrous speed. So, okay, so that's definitely one thing. So you need to understand like what is doable. And, uh, but, but I want to point out that what is doable is not actually constant. It varies a lot based on circumstances. So the acceleration that you get, the traction that you get is going to depend on whether you're on carpet or whether you're on uh, polished wood or whether you're on tile and so on, right? Um, what other kinodynamic effects, what, when you're traveling at low speed, you assume that certain things will not happen. What are, can you give some examples of like uh, things which you not expect to happen with real cars? What kinds of motions are not possible with real cars or you think is not possible with real cars? So what are the kinematic constraints of a car? Yeah. I guess there's the non-holonomic consideration that cars can't go sideways without turning. Yeah, so that's a good one. So you believe that the kinematic constraints should say that your car can't actually drive sideways. It turns out interestingly at high enough speeds under certain controls and under certain types of uh, uh, terrain, the cars do slide sideways. And um, some of that you can actually control, some of that is uncontrollable, but you know these things happen, right? So, okay, so I'm just trying to make the point that predicting what the outcome is gonna be based on your controls is a non-trivial problem. It depends on the state, okay? Um, and what we care about is that the first thing that we looked at is actually learning accurate inverse kinodynamics, right? And the motivation is that we want to deploy accurate high-speed off-road navigation on unstructured terrain. In particular, what we want to do is that we want our robot uh, or a car to drive over things like cement and cement with leaves, mud, grass, and so on. And the thing to note is that these variations are not discrete. There's not like, you can't actually come up with like a discrete class of, this is one discrete class of type of terrain. You, this is one discrete class of terrain, right? So it's, it's, it's not homogeneous, it's actually varying and so on, okay? Um, so, uh, so, so the learning this uh, kinodynamic model uh, could actually help you understand how this robot will interact with the environment, okay? Um, okay, so what we wanna do is we want to, uh, have a mobile robot track a reference trajectory during deployment as quickly and accurately as possible. Now this, the question is where does the reference trajectory come from? So the, the question, the answer to that is partially, you have already done something like this, or you've, or you've seen some of this in class. Some of this is actually open to research as well. Okay, so you can do offline racing line optimization. So uh, I, I don't know, Rahul, if you've covered that yet, but I, I know you guys do a fair bit of that. So yeah, talk yeah, Rahul covered. about ideas for doing racing line optimization. And that's where your reference trajectories could, for example, come from, okay. Um, however, and we'll come back to this later, we can think about like how we can op improve on these reference trajectories. So what we're trying to do is that we have this car, we have some reference trajectory, we're trying to uh, execute something. Uh, during deployment, which is as quickly as quick as possible, but also as accurately as possible. Now, our objective function is going to be uh, cast in this form where you have uh, two parts. One is you want to minimize the total time, but you also have uh, some amount of uh, error in like uh, the actual executed uh, location of the car and the planned uh, location of the car. So you want to minimize some uh, the error between there. And this gamma gives you the trade-off between the two. So clearly, like if you clip corners, uh, you will penalize, the second part will take a hit, whereas the first part you might be able to improve upon. But the reason why you want, to, uh, you want to minimize the error between the reference trajectory is because the reference trajectory looks ahead. Whereas this, uh, this it, using just this local planner, you're only doing local optimization. So while you might clip the corner and be faster in that segment, it will put you in a bad state for like the next segment of the, of the, of the track, right? So that's why you want to follow a reference trajectory, uh, a racing line uh, over time, okay? But this is a, a general like high level um, uh, objective function. 
Now to add to the difficulty, what's going to happen is that we want to do this when different parts of the trajectory are under different types of terrain. So like there's mud over there, there's uh, like rocks and leaves over here and so on, right? Okay, so how do you actually do this? Okay, so let me give you a pipeline of how you might do this. So you have a desired trajectory. You have some controller which provides some controls and this forward kinodynamic function is the world essentially. So this is the world um, and uh, it's actually providing the robot state. Now, this forward kinodynamic function is not, a, it's not a constant forward kinodynamic function. It depends on a world state W, right? Which is gonna be all of these conditions in the real world, okay? Now, how do you actually have this controller? Ideally, what would you like to do in this controller? What you'd like to ideally like to do is that you would like to run an inverse kinodynamic function, F inverse, which says that based on my current state X and based on the world state W, and based on the desired uh, uh, change that I want to have in the state, the delta x, you should be able to compute the optimal control. There are a couple of problems about this. One is that this true world state w is actually not going to be known, right? So first of all, we don't even know what all in the world state actually affects this. There are many things in the world state which actually affect uh, this, uh, this response. There's, thing, there's, there's all kinds of things like, what is the, uh, the material uh, of the terrain? What's the humidity? What's the temperature? What's the, uh, the moisture content, right? right? So this world state is actually very, very complex, right? And coming up with a physics-based model of like this F inverse taking into account the full world state is actually quite intractable, okay? Uh, for this wide variety of terrain, okay? So uh, what are the existing approaches to dealing with this problem? Uh, there are a couple of canonical approaches dealing with this. One is that, um, so this world state might be unknown, but what if you have some observe function, some y, which is uh, passed through some observation function g, right? And you get some observations y. And then based on some observations, uh, what you can actually do is that you can choose a terrain specific model. So you can actually use your observations to say that I'm now driving over wood or I'm now driving over concrete. And hence I can choose a different terrain specific model so you cancel out this W and you can choose an F inverse based on F inverse concrete or F inverse wood or F inverse uh, leaves. Okay? Uh, and there's a lot of work on, uh, on doing terrain classification and then you choose your F inverse model and you like come up with a very uh, well chosen or well learned F inverse model for each of these discrete types of terrain. However, what we want to do is, uh, is something uh, slightly different. Okay? What we want to do is that we want to have an all terrain model which just directly takes in these observations and instead of having to do the discrete classification of what types of uh, type of terrain you're driving over, you want to have it work for continuous variations of terrain, okay? And here's a key idea. The way we're gonna make this work is that we're gonna say that we don't know what this W is, okay? However, the, the relevant parts of W, w can be made observable via the observations, uh, a history of observations Y, okay? So uh, if you have this F inverse delta X, X and W, instead of doing this, this computing this exact, exact inverse, you can have a pseudo inverse, which instead of taking in first of all W, it only takes in a history of inputs Y and then it's uh, parameterized theta, which is to say this is actually a learned pseudo inverse, okay? And that's actually the key idea of what we're trying to do. Can we learn a pseudo inverse, okay? Uh, such that these raw observations provide you insights as to what controls will generate this desired Delta X based on a current X, okay? Okay, um, let me just pause here and see if there are any questions so far. Any questions? <laughs> You're going to see this in the in the Ikra race. <coughs> you won't be training on that smooth surface over there. I think they're good. Okay, cool. Let's keep going. All right. So um, what we want to do is that uh, to learn this inverse kinodynamic function, we want to learn vehicle terrain interaction data during off-road deployment. What we do is we record the vehicle controls, the robot states, the observations, and the actual outcomes from the real world forward kinodynamics delta x, okay? And this gives our training uh, um, uh, tuples for all of time. So it gives you the actual outcomes, what was the state with, uh, before in the previous time step, uh, what were the controls that you were applying, and what were your observations? 
So to do this, you actually don't need to run a controller. You can literally just like joystick the, the robot around. And all you need to do is make sure you cover the space of states and controls. Okay. And uh, if you cover this, uh, the space of states and controls over different types of terrain, you, uh, you should actually do a good job of overcoming, I mean, uh, getting a diverse set of like, observations right? and also these uh, outcomes. Okay. okay, now here's a key trick. What we want to do is that we want to train a regression model uh, with deployment experiences. And then what we want to do is that we want to pretend that these actual ex outcomes are actually desired, right? So we play the trick of uh, saying that we want to train the, F, uh, the, the pseudo inverse model such that the, the pseudo inverse model should return the actual command that we executed. And then we feed in that the actual outcome that was happening, we want to say that if we wanted that to happen, this controller is what should have been output from it. Okay. So we're playing the trick where the actual outcome is what we're pretending as if what we were trying to achieve. And if that is the case, then the controls that you actually applied should be the answer to that, right? It, okay, so I wanna pause here and actually make an observation that this is actually not necessarily a one-to-one -one mapping. There could be uh, multiple different types of control for which the, uh, the same outcome is possible. However, we just need like one solution and the, exact, and the solution for that is what control did you actually apply when this Delta X occurred, right? Uh, so if you have one example, that's good enough. And that's actually the training uh, loss that you have. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is a training loss. And then you want to op optimize uh, um, your neural network for this, such that you minimize that. Okay. Okay. There are a couple more uh, details uh, about what you need to do to actually get this to work uh, pretty well. So first of all, asking a blind neural network to solve for this full uh, inverse function is actually quite hard. Okay, so invariably, when you're doing learning, it's always good to have some amount of like model plus correction and the correction is what you actually learn. And the model doesn't need to be that complicated. It can be quite simple. And in our case, what we do is that, uh, so remember that we had a reference trajectory. What we can use as a model is that we could just use kinematic based a control to come up with an estimate of what is your uh, first of all your delta uh, x pi, right? Uh, and then what we can do is that we can say that if we actually want to uh, execute uh, that delta x, my uh, my kinematic model would come up with some control. And then uh, what happens is that the learning task is just trying to uh, come up with some small modification of the control such that it actually accounts for the kinodynamic responses. Okay, um, and that's that's all there is to it. Okay. Um, this is our car. I mean, it's very similar to what you have. It's got the Hokuyo, it's got the NVIDIA Jetson, um, and so on, right? Um, to actually implement this, uh, what we do is that we take a, a sliding window history of the accelerator and gyroscope. Uh, we encode them through, uh, through two hidden layers, and then we end up with a very uh, low, um, a low dimension embedding. And at that stage, we feed in also the desired uh, velocity and curvature and then we concatenate them and then run them through another uh, two hidden layers and then we get out uh, your, your correction in the velocity and curvature space. Okay. And that's actually going to be what you learn. So this is our, our network and actually we want to uh, just modify this correction. Okay, okay. Um, okay so those are the, the different parts to it. Um, I want to go into a little bit in uh, details into like the code and just show you how this implemented code. It's actually not that hard to implement in code. But before I go ahead, let me just see if there are any uh, any questions so far. So control uh, parameterization is just the linear velocity and curvature uh, that we want to uh, execute. So the linear velocity is going to control your uh, your motor, and your curvature is going to control your steering. Um, and then what's going to happen is that the learned model is automatically going to learn things like oversteering and understeering as required, over accelerating and under accelerating as required. Okay. Question. Um, did you experience any like overfitting for track specific like training or was it diverse enough data from like multiple different tracks with many different combinations of terrains? Yeah, so we didn't even uh, we didn't really train it in the uh, place where we actually ran the track. Um, this was partly an artifact of how the setup happened. So the track that we actually tested it on had like walls and all, and the human could not manually uh, drive the robot at high enough speeds 
such that we'd be able to like train it uh, in the track. So we just tested it in like a similar environment right next to the track. And all we did was like, just drive it around like crazily. We just, we just uh, uh, pretended to be like a madman driving with a joystick, just not trying to hit, try not to hit obstacles. That's all we did. Um, so yeah, so, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's certainly overfitting, like all learned models overfit to uh, uh, some degree. Um, but I will show you some results where we ran it on a terrain, which is very different from where we ran it on. And it's actually, while it is an easier terrain, it's nice to see that it actually works well there in, in that uh, in that test environment. But I will, I will pr provide some, uh, present some, uh, some results of that in a second. Okay. Yeah, other questions? Okay, cool. So um, if you go to the UTMRL graph navigation stack uh, under the off-road branch, you can find a code implementation for this. Um, and let me just very quickly walk you through what's happening here. So uh, the curvature command and the velocity command at the top over there are uh, what's just using a kinematic controller, right? And then uh, what we have is that we concatenate uh, a time series uh, history of the IMU observations, okay? Um, and then uh, what we do is that we run this through the module and then we get uh, to, to actually run this through the pseudo inverse. Uh, and that's how we actually get the commands. Okay. All right. So let's just think a little bit about what the understanding or the assumption here is, right? Um, to understand what the assumptions here is, let me just go back to uh, when I was talking about our approach. Okay. Okay. So our assumption here is that based on these observations y, the world's hidden world state w become uh, observable. And in particular, the observations that we're considering is a time series uh, window history uh, of the IMU observation. And this is uh, accelerometer and gyroscope. And the reason why that makes sense is because how bumpy or how smooth a uh, terrain is, is gives you some information about whether you're driving on say gravel or concrete or uh, leaves and so on. And that information can be exploited by your, uh, your learned inverse kinodynamic controller to actually modify your controls to account for the kinodynamic responses there, right? So, so that's actually the insight behind uh, what's actually going on, okay? Okay, uh, so let me just uh, show you some videos. So this is um, a video of the car actually running. So while it's running on the leaves, you can actually see that it's definitely like sliding sideways. And in, in another turn, you can see it sliding sideways more significantly here. Um, So interestingly, so we ran it. So on the top uh, is uh, what you have is on the top left is the, the default kinematic model. On the top right is the learned model. And uh, it's whenever there is a failure, it's marked as manual intervention and failures. Um, and uh, on the left uh, bottom uh, is the kinematic model in an unseen terrain, which is uh, polished wood. Let me just go back for a second there so I can replay that. Okay. And on the bottom right is uh, unseen terrain, which is polished wood. So we trained on terrain, uh, which is similar to this. We had like some amount of grass and leaves and concrete and dirt and so on, right? And we ran it in this, in this course, okay. Um, right, okay. So I'll, I'll talk about like the, uh, the quantitative results um, here, okay. All right, so, um, Here, let me just uh, play all of these videos. Oh, I'm not playing media. Hmm. Codec kind of okay, not a problem. Let me just talk through here. So what's happening here is that uh, for each of these turns in this terrain, we logged what was the failure mode, failure rates of the different algorithms. So we have the baseline, which is a pure kinematic based approach. The learned IKD is a full algorithm. Uh, and then you have uh, the ablation, which is uh, not using the uh, the observations of the INU. Okay. Uh, and by and large, you see like there's a lot of failures of the baseline algorithm. Um, as the speed goes up, they all start failing to some degrees, um, but the learned IKD is the most robust to all of them. Um, and the, the reference trajectory is shown in black over here. 
Um, so in the in the unseen terrain, which where we ran with uh, uh, on on wood on polished wood essentially, um, our learned IKD still outperforms the baseline. So that's interesting. Uh, although it's to be noted that this uh, particular type of um, unseen terrain, the wood, is actually an easier terrain than uh, than gravel and dirt and grass. So it worked reasonably well, uh, and probably that's because uh, wood is probably driving on wood is similar to in some degrees to like driving on like uh, cement or something. Um, if it were to be on a completely different terrain, then I don't expect it to work quite so well. Okay, uh, a couple more quantitative results. We quantified uh, for each turn what was the order of errors, and uh, by and large, for all of the turns except uh, for turn eight. Uh, the learning based approach had the lowest failure rate. In turn eight, uh, what actually happened is that the learned model had the highest failure rate compared to the other ones. And then, so we were wondering what happened in turn eight. So if you look at turn eight, what happens is that the car comes from grass and then abruptly transitions onto concrete. Okay. So this is a good point to come back and rethink things a little bit. What assumptions did we make? And how can we relax these assumptions? So this, this very small nugget over here uh, actually gives you some insights about what are the limitations of this approach? What assumptions did we make? And what should the next step be? OK, so can you, uh, can you guess as to what's going on over here? Yeah, go ahead. Um, since it's using or the model is using like prior time step data from the gyro and accelerometer, it's probably like uh, adjusting from a high drifting terrain to something that's pretty high coefficient of friction. And it's still, um, there's still a transition that exists. And so it doesn't know that it's transitioned from, you know, those two terrains. Fantastic. That's exactly what's happening. So. The key assumption that we made here is that the terrain that we have seen the sliding window history of the observation is going to continue happening in the future. And in this uh, turn, what happens is that there's an abrupt transition from grass, which is slippery, and the car is oversteering to, uh, to compensate for slip. And then it goes on to concrete, where, which has lots of grip. And if you oversteer it, like it uh, drives headfirst into this wall over here. Okay. So that's the problem. Okay. Uh, how can you relax these assumptions? How can you actually do something better? Any thoughts, any ideas of what you would do to overcome this problem? I'm, I'm not sure if it's already encoded in the model itself. Or maybe you're just applying some like uh, filter based on like like weighing uh, more recent samples heavier than like past samples, but I feel like that's a pretty simple solution. Yeah, so weighting recent samples is always a good thing to do, but uh, note that even recent samples don't give you any information about the future, right? The recent past won't tell you what's happening in the future, right? So what will tell you about what's happening in the future? Yeah, go ahead. After you've completed one lap around the track, can you create <laughs> some sort of model of the environment if you know you're going to be racing on the same race course? Uh, I, I think I didn't get the full thing of what you're saying, but are you proposing like using the track, uh, the in information about the track? Uh, yes. Exactly. Yes. Okay. All right. So one thing you could do definitely is that you can actually build a map of what are the kinodynamic responses over the track and use that to actually plan ahead. Okay, so we thought about that. We did not do that and we'd love to do that. If you want to have, a, uh, this is actually a fantastic project idea and I'd love to collaborate on this if you want to do this, okay? Uh, we'd like to actually build a map of what the kinodynamic responses are on different types of terrain. And here's another thing that you can do. If you do that, you can go back and revise your reference trajectory. So recall that the reference trajectory was the optimal racing line but when that was created, it didn't know about the kinodynamic responses in different places. You could, after you've done, after you've done this, 
you could actually go back and refine your reference trajectory and build a map of the kinodynamic response in the track. Okay, very good approach. We're not doing this yet. Uh, we would love to do this. If you want to do this, it's a very good project and I want to be uh, help collaborate on that. Okay, okay, cool. What else can you do? What if, you, what if you're not actually running on a track? What if you're running in the open world and if you're not in a track? What else can you do? Yeah, you can come forward. You can come, come, come forward. Yeah, very cool. So, I mean, you should be able to look ahead and be using the camera to see what's coming up, right? The, 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 the car should be able to see that, oh, look, it's on grass now, but up ahead, there's concrete. So it should realize that I don't need to actually overcompensate as I'm going over, right? Okay. So that's exactly what we decided to focus on next, right? We want to understand how can we use this visual information to actually improve the, uh, the in inverse kinodynamic, okay? Okay, at this point, what I'm gonna do is that, um, so we, we discussed a little bit of the assumptions that we made and uh, how can we relax these assumptions, but I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about this related, seemingly unrelated problem called visual representation learning for preference aware path planning. And I'll explain why actually this is a relevant problem. So taking vision information <laughs> is actually very uh, hard because vision is very high, uh, high dimensional. The learning problem needs to be very well specified such that you can learn it with a small amount of data and that it doesn't choke, okay? So what's gonna happen is that we need to have a very sound learning framework for this to work, okay? And uh, representation learning turns out to be a very powerful approach in these kind of settings where you don't have a large amount of data and you don't have a ton amount, ton of labels data is a key part, okay? Okay, so let me tell you about a little bit about how we use representation learning for preference aware planning, okay? And the key insight and the key uh, application that we had for this was um, adapting to user needs. So for example, I showed you the videos of our robots being deployed on the campus scale. We want what we want to do is that we want to teach our uh, robots to essentially stick to the sidewalk in these kinds of settings. Okay, um, some of them have sidewalks. I mean, concrete sidewalks. So there is a reasonably uh, sharp boundary. Um, they could be windy, but there could also be places where there is no sharp boundary, but it kind of needs to like follow this trail. Okay. Okay. So what's the canonical approach to doing this? The canonical approach to doing this is to do semantic segmentation. There are a couple of problems with semantic segmentation. First of all, in places where you don't have like sharp boundaries, semantic segmentation artificially introduces these hard boundaries. And uh, it doesn't necessarily make sense that uh, to have this sharp boundaries, okay? Secondly, semantic segmentation needs a pre-enumerated discrete number of types of terrain for it to be successful, okay? Um, and if you encounter a new type of terrain, you will need to uh, collect a ton of new training data, labeled training data, to actually learn about this new semantic class. Okay. Uh, we wanted to come up with an approach which, first of all, did not have this hard boundaries, discrete boundaries, and secondly, did not have this problem of pre-enumerating these discrete things. So uh, our key idea here was to leverage unlabeled human demonstrations to simultaneously learn visual embeddings of terrains and also preferences over the embeddings for preference-aware planning. Okay. Uh, this is something which we're going to actually present at a crowd this summer. So um, you, you should come to uh, talk if you're interested in uh, learning more about this. Okay. Um, okay. So let me just tell you how this works during deployment. Okay. So during deployment, uh, the camera gets an image. Okay. So first of all, using the camera extrinsics and intrinsics, we simulate a synthetic bird's eye view of what the world looks like as if you if you're looking down over the robot. Okay. And that's what this looks like. Next, we're trying to do path planning in this uh, local path planning, even in the, this environment, right? So we want to ask the question of, given this patch in this image, uh, we want to pass it through a learned visual representation function, which will give you a visual uh, a terrain embedding. And that will be passed through some learned uh, visual preference cost function, and that will give you a cost. So black is good, white is bad, and uh, this will give you preference over consistent costs. Once you have this, you can actually just do uh, planning with these costs, okay? So the question is, how do you learn this uh, visual representation function? And how do you learn this uh, visual preference cost function? Okay, as I said, we ask for human demonstrations. 
So let me give you an example of what a human demonstration looks like. So this is a human demonstration where the robot starts out here and then it, uh, the human is driving it to this building over here. So it demonstrates a path which sticks to the sidewalks in this grid. Okay. However, at this point, the robot doesn't know about different types of terrain at all, right? So all of this visual information that I'm showing you as helpful to, the ro uh, helpful to understand what's going on, the robot doesn't know anything about it. The robot really just sees this trajectory. That's all that it knows about, okay? However, here's a key thing, okay? If you look at this trajectory locally within the local planning window, so every local planner has some horizon. So uh, you call it, like, uh, I, I don't remember what you exactly call it in, uh, in your class, but there's, there's some carrot distance that you plan ahead, plan ahead for the look ahead distance, right? Within that distance, you can, the robot can hypothesize shortcuts, okay? So now uh, what happens here is that the robot uh, realizes that there's a human demonstration shown in red. There should have been a shorter cut taken in green. Why did the human not take that? There must be some reason that the human did not do that, okay? So what's gonna happen is that from the local, from the synthetic bird's eye view, okay, as the robot's moving along this red trajectory, you can generate the synthetic bird's eye view from the image, for example, from the robot over here. And then what you can do is that extract a patch along the human demonstration and extract a patch along the hypothesized shortcut. And all you see is that the visual embeddings of these two must be different. We don't know how they're different. We don't know how far apart they are, but they need to be at least some margin delta V apart in the representation space. That's all there is to it. Okay, okay so that's one uh, part of the puzzle. The second part of the puzzle is that we want to enforce viewpoint invariance. So what does that mean? It means, let's say you have a demonstration shown in blue. The robot collected image data as it was moving along the trajectory. So take a certain location in the world. Let's say that that's that you have this green uh, box over here. By the way, can you guys see my mouse cursor? Yes, okay, cool. Uh, so this green box is the same location in these two images, but these two images are captured from different time sets. So what we're gonna see is that no matter what, the visual embeddings of this patch and the patch of the same location as seen from a different viewpoint must uh, tend to zero. The difference between the two must tend to zero. So this is how we enforce viewpoint invariance, okay? I also wanna point a pause here and actually point out that Interestingly, this view, this, this approach of providing viewpoint invariance also magically gives us some amount of lighting invariance as well. Can you guess as to how this might give you lighting invariance? This is actually a non-trivial uh, idea because we weren't expecting this. Uh, we discovered that this actually uh, gained some amount of lighting invariance as well, but we had to figure out why. Just for, for something like sidewalks um, or paths where the terrain is maybe like white or reflective, it might have different you know, intensities at different angles. Okay, so that's that's definitely one thing, which is that, <coughs> excuse me, not all types of terrain are pure Lambertian. If these surfaces were Lambertian, then their then their appearance would be the same irrespective of which angle you looked at them at. So certainly, what you're talking about is true that this approach will uh, account for non-Lambertian surfaces. But there's another thing that happens that since these two images were captured at different time steps. Something else happens to help you out. So, okay, I'll give you the answer. So inevitably, when you're doing this in the real world, um, between two time steps, if a cloud goes over the sky and then this is a different clouded uh, a time step than this, the lighting is gonna be a little bit different. Secondly, and here's a very interesting thing which we weren't expecting. If uh, some of these patches are under uh, trees, right? And then due to the wind, the tree leaves are moving, you'll get like different mottled patches of sunlight and, uh, and shadow. And uh, if you say that the visual embeddings of the two must be the same, you're trying to bake in this invariance to the, the shadows of the leaves and stuff like that, okay? That's gonna be very important in like a, a, a challenging uh, 
test environment, which I'm going to show in a second. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so putting together uh, this idea of distinct visual representations and similar visual representations, you can come up with a triplet loss where you say that you can come up with an anchor patch, a dissimilar patch, and a similar patch. So the anchor patch and dissimilar patches are taken from uh, on, tra on uh, uh, trajectory and off trajectory data. And the anchor patch and similar patch are taken from the, uh, the projection of the same location in the world as seen from different time steps. So all we're going to say is that the loss is going to constrain that the difference in the representation space between the anchor and dissimilar is going to be greater than the anchor and similar plus the margin delta. Okay. So this is the training loss. Uh, okay. So this is a training constraint to come on, uh, come up with the training loss. So all you do is that whenever this inequality is not satisfied, you uh, provide a loss proportional to how much it's been unsatisfied by. If this inequality is satisfied, then there's no loss. Okay. And you do this for, uh, for randomly chosen sets of anchor, dissimilar, and similar. Since you're choosing large amounts of sets of triplets, anchor, dissimilar, and similar, even though you have a small demonstration uh, trajectory, you can collect a very large, combinatorically large uh, set of triplets. And this is really the power to uh, why, why this works so well. Okay, so this is how you train the visual representations. Once you have trained your visual representation, uh, what you can specify is that given your embeddings of your anchor and embeddings of your dissimilar, you can compute the, uh, the cost that the, 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 the robot would have been taken if you're taken the off path and uh, uh, the on path. All you're trying to say is that there is some uh, delta margin between the cost of the human demonstration versus the uh, the robot hypothesized shortcut path, and that's all there is to it. We're we're not saying what is the absolute cost. We're not saying how much it's better than. All we're saying is that it's better than by by a little bit by a margin. Okay. So this allows the these learned cost functions to arbitrarily vary the cost as long as these cons, uh, these preferences are satisfied. In this example, I've only shown a preference between two types of terrain, but your, de your demonstrations can actually often have preferences between, between, say, concrete and gravel, concrete and grass, grass and gravel, dirt and grass, and so on. Okay. Um, and what's happening is that these constraints provide a partial order, but then the learned uh, cost function needs to come up with the total ordering such that the partial orders of all of these preferences is consistent. Okay, And that's part of the learning problem. Okay, and that can be done. Okay, um, I can uh, present some of uh, the the results on uh, on uh, on this approach. But before I talk about results, uh, let's see if there are questions about the approach. Any questions? Yeah. Um, can we also use the IMU data uh, and find similar uh, kind of things in the embedding and then try to figure out if the path is indeed a grassy patch or a road patch uh, to just supplement this technique? Fantastic. <laughs> yes, you can. And we are working on that idea right now. I have a student working on just that idea right now. Okay, absolutely. Okay, other questions? Okay, no questions right now. We can come back to it. All right, let me just talk about some results. Um, okay, so let's just back up a little bit and talk about like what this approach allows you to do. What this approach allows you to do is that in these scenarios uh, where you have uh, these sidewalks and grass, you just the human provides a demonstration and the robot uh, afterwards infers how to stick to the sidewalks and not drive over the grass. There is something else that you could have actually done to prevent the robot from driving over the grass. You could actually have manually tediously annotated a navigation graph and told it that this is the edge you should follow. The edge is of this much width. The edge goes here and it's like this much width and so on. Um, this, by the way, this is a very common technique. Like uh, many, many of the, uh, the, the so-called autonomous uh, uh, last mile delivery robot companies, they actually do that. They provide like human annotation of like where the robots are, are allowed to go and not allowed to go. Okay. So if you provide a lot of this uh, tedious annotation, you could get similar uh, results. Okay. So for in terms of like evaluation, what we try to do is 
what we uh, in these terrains, what we did is like we provided uh, what's called an annotated geometric uh, result, where we annotated tediously the parts and the the the, the walkways and so, and saw where the robot would uh, drive. Okay. A pure geometric approach was not given any of this annotated readings and just uh, asked to go from A to B. Okay. And a reference trajectory is something where we asked a human to just joystick the robot and say, okay, give me a demonstration or not a demonstration. Give me an example of how you would have done this. Okay. And these are just qualitative results of what the what uh, what it looks like. Um, of course, the pure geometric approach, which is not aware of like the different types of terrain, just blindly drives all over the grass all the time. Sometimes it includes operating intervention because it will lead to unsafe behavior. But both uh, VRLPAP as well as the annotated geometric approach uh, does a pretty good job of sticking to the sidewalk. Um, and we also do things like uh, compute the house start distance between the trajectory um, of, the, of the human and the trajectory executed. And we show that the preference aware learning approach actually minimizes that distance um, pretty consistently. Um, except, okay, in trajectory three, uh, it's pretty close, but the annotated geometry, which is where you tediously annotate the geometry, uh, it does a little bit better. This all boils down to like how much effort you put into like annotating a geometry map. Okay, uh, we also deployed it in the park uh, in, a, in a second uh, environment where, you, where the, the delineations, delineations between grass and concrete or, or on sidewalk is not quite so clear and it's like more fuzzy, right? And we get similar uh, results over there. Right. Just qualitatively in the park, uh, you can see that this is uh, an input image. You can see that it's actually picking out uh, the low cost trajectory pretty well, okay? Okay, however, one of the, the goals of this approach was that we should be able to adapt to new types of terrain very quickly because we don't need to collect a large amount of uh, labeled data. We need some additional data, but we don't necessarily need label data. Uh, can we actually verify that? The answer is yes, we can actually verify that. So here's an example. In this trajectory, you have concrete and you have gravel. Initially, our preference aware planner had not show, been shown any demonstrations of gravel versus concrete. So it executes uh, what's actually shown by um, the brown. So it drives over the gravel. Okay. And the semantic segmentation approach uh, also drives over the gravel. However, just given uh, just this one turning of data, okay, nothing more. Uh, we we're able to refine the uh, visual representation learning approach where now it suddenly starts picking up the gravel and now uh, uh, the VRLPAP, the blue line, uh, very nicely follows the reference trajectory and avoids going onto the, uh, the gravel, right? With, without, uh, uh, without any labeling or anything. All it's doing is that it's we're just giving a little bit more joystick data, that's it. Okay. Uh, we deployed this much more extensively. Uh, what we did is that we gave some demonstrations in like one corner of the park. We started out a robot uh, at a trail in a park and we asked it to just keep following the path as uh, far as you can. This is almost a kilometer long. It's about, I think, like 800 meters long or something, long or something. So I'll just play a video of what that looks like. Let me just pause here and uh, tell you what's going on. This is the input image. This is a colorized map showing the learned visual representation. So similar colors mean similar visual representations, different means different. And this is the learned cost map. What you'll see is that the robot's actually able to um, generalize between these shadows. So the shadow on the dirt is the same as dirt without shadows. So, and it really doesn't care too much about the shadows at all, as you can see. And it's able to follow uh, this, uh, this dirt path. Um, just uh, on its own, just follows the dirt path, keeps going. Okay, questions. Questions. Is it is it possible that the uh, that the light independence is just a factor of the, the one time the way you happen to train it? Like, are you sure that's repeatable, or is it a fluid process? Um. I only partially got the question. Is it possible that the lighting invariance is something to do with people? I don't understand what you meant by it. Is it possible that it just happened this one time or is it like a repeatable known thing? Because you have an explanation. Uh, I really hope it's true. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not sure. Yeah, so 
we haven't done too much investigation, but we've at least seen like uh, we've uncovered like several uh, places where this uh, there's in the training data by uh, by just the very nature that we're choosing like temporal information, we end up getting uh, examples where the similar patch has um, uh, some <coughs> changes in the lighting. We don't actually enforce that. And uh, we don't know to what extent how much of our data has that, but we know at least a fair bit does. I don't know. I actually don't know what fraction of our data has that, but we we started seeing that it was able to have lighting invariance, and we are curious as to why it was able to do that because there's nothing in a loss function which would do that, um, and that, that's that's when we actually started digging a little bit into it. Okay. Was the training and then the testing done on the same day or how far apart in terms of the time of day or the weather? So the, the, in the extensive evaluation, they were on different days, completely different days. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it turns out like deploying robots in the field is actually quite time consuming. So by the time you pack up all of the materials of like having batteries for like laptops and uh, and you, if you want to monitor the robot, you need to have like some way of like wirelessly accessing the robot. This does the robot doesn't have access to the UT campus Wi-Fi here, so we need to have our own wireless network to be able to um, see what it's doing if you want to visualize what it's doing and to like remotely SSH into it. Anyway, setting up like a uh, an off-road experiment is actually time consuming, which is why we by necessity we had to do these experiments <laughs> over multiple days. <coughs> Yeah, another question. Would it be possible for the robot to struggle with very wide paths or basically like really wide sidewalks <laughs> where it might the whole cost map might be like close to zero and it could drift, I guess, from like human reference path? Yeah, very good question. So the humans actually, humans actually turns out don't really care too much about optimality. They care about like some plausible paths, but like, yeah, they, they just follow the sidewalk and they want like clip corners. Um, I actually skimmed over the details a little bit in the paper, we've talked into a little bit more details, uh, which answer partially the question that you asked, which is that what is the total cost of the local planner when we're doing deployments? Uh, when we're doing deployments, we don't just take into account preference aware planning. We also take into account which trajectories are going to take us closer to our, uh, our intermediate goal, the local carrot, okay? Uh, and it's kind of like in a hierarchical manner. So first of all, uh, we exclude out anything which would hit geometric obstacles. So with LIDAR, we rule out anything which would hit obstacles. Amongst the remaining path trajectory rollouts, uh, we compute um, those which will have negative progress towards the goal, right? And we exclude those. So any path trajectory rollout which would make like positive um, progress towards the goal is a viable candidate. And those are ranked based on this path uh, preference awareness. Okay. Um, in this in this outdoor uh, data set, what we did is that the local target was just some synthetic distance, a carrot like four meters ahead of. I don't remember if it was four, like ten meters, some amount of distance constantly ahead of the robot. So all it was doing is basically was following a carrot on a stick. But uh, there are the fact the factors I've taken into account are how close are you going to get to the local target. So if you have a wide space, a wide sidewalk where all of the costs are about the same, it just tries to like shorten the path distance because it will take it closer to the local target while staying on uh, having the same type of cost. Okay. So from that perspective on a, on a large wide sidewalk, uh, you will see that the robot will do things differently than what the human will do. The human will, uh, I don't know, will probably stick to the center of the sidewalk, but the robot will very much uh, try to stay to the edge of the sidewalk and will try to like, you know, be optimum, which is to stay to near the edge. Does that make sense? One more question. The trajectory you showed uh, the robot was a left turn when there was a similar path ahead uh, in, in, in the park, I guess. So was it a part of the trajectory planner or did the robot do that due to the confidence level of, the, of that particular point? I mean, what led the robot to take the best one? Um, are you talking about these trajectories? Uh, no, in the, in, the, in the earlier one, which you showed where you just let a robot run. Yeah. No. Uh, Sorry, which trajectories are you referring to? Uh, 
the one where you let a robot run uh, in a park in the one minute i guess in a in a deep park you can make it over around the kilometer long no oh, okay uh, this one yeah so here yeah. they see that the path is the path looks like it, 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 it is the same when you just go straight ahead but then it takes a left turn uh, in the beginning i i did so i couldn't understand is it built into the trajectory or because you mentioned if it has to minimize the path to the goal that seems like an optimal path rather than around the bottom yeah so even in the local planner so uh, the way we uh, weight these multiple trade offs is we just do something very simple we just do a linear combination of weights um and now you actually start seeing limitations of just doing this at a local planning level so at the local planner level uh, you have you're trying to minimize these uh, the the trade offs between something here and something there uh, in this scenario it So from this satellite overview, it seems like it should have just gone straight. But uh, let's see. Can I just go to the video and actually see what happened there? Yeah, it's actually not clear what happened there. But uh, inevitably, what happened is like something made the cost function believe like there was the cost over there. There was slightly higher than the cost over here, uh, and it saw that both of these were like the same kind of dirt path. So it preferred to take this dirt path than that dirt path. um and this is actually a limitation of using a pure local planner rather than a global planner and in this case we don't really care because we were just telling it like to stay stick to the uh, uh, um a gravel path uh this this particular path kind of like um dead ends into something i, I don't remember what this is maybe it's something like a pool or something um if you want to like keep and for something like if you're trying to get here then you need to include like uh taking into these preferences at the global planner level as well and that's something which we're looking into like uh we have all of this rich information at the local planning level can we actually record that and expose that to the global planning level such that when you plan out a path a long path you need to think about like when it is important for you to take a left turn versus a right turn okay so that's i mean it's, uh, the short answer is that it's basically an artifact of how do you do the combination of the weights in the local plan Okay. Um. Other question. Any other questions so far? It's good. Okay. Cool. Let's go ahead. All right. So, the the next thing which I want to briefly talk about is visual inverse uh visual visual inertial inverse kinetic dynamics (VIIKD). And the idea here is actually very simple. So previously, I showed you about how you can use this uh, IMU history. and then uh, feed it through a network to actually get corrected uh, controls as an inverse kinetic model now what we want to do is an include inputs of visual representations and these visual representations are fed in uh, in parallel and then afterwards we combine them concatenate them into a fully connected uh, three layer fully connected network and then that needs to provide the controls okay so uh the whole reason why i uh, spoke about the the visual representation uh learning uh, is because it gives us good insights to understand what kind of representations do we need to feed into this network for the visual part in particular it's actually very important to have this uh, uh this visual uh, the, the viewpoint invariance by the way remember the thing about spoke about like lighting invariance you can see some of that actually show out uh, play off over here so this is the same location at different points and uh, the same patch extracted from different viewpoints and you can see like the lighting uh, variations are actually uh, slightly different so um, like there is this part is light it's, it's not light over here there's some light over here but it's not here and so on but then there this section is like light in all of them uh, so you can see a little bit at least of the uh, of the lighting invariance that I was talking about anyway so using this viewpoint invariance to like match to similar uh, embedding and uh, if you have completely different terrains and completely different sponsors you can say like the embeddings will be different over there okay so that allows you to actually train a uh, pre-train the embedding part of the visual embedding and then one and then you can concatenate all of them and actually come up with uh, a stacked version of vision which will give you information about what's coming up in the future imu which will give you information about what's in the past actually by the way this imu actually uh, the vision includes a couple of patches uh, along the trajectory rather than just a single patch but between the two of them you should be able to learn an ikd model which can predict how things will change in the future compared to just worrying about the past and that's um, 
that's actually uh, a paper that we have under review at the moment. You can uh, see the archive version of that, provide a link to that. Uh, we tested this on what we call the alpha truck. It's a scale one fifth car. It's a uh, souped up version of uh, the one tenth cars. It's designed for really high speed and uh, off road uh, experiments. In particular, what we did is that we have this uh, this circuit, which we're trying to execute with different types of terrain, and it has includes uh, transitions between them. And uh, we check like the success rates across the turns, and uh, uh, the visual IKD actually does outperform. Um, both the IMU IKD and the others. Um, and I can show you just a, a short video clip of this in action. Um, yeah, and uh, that's basically it. So that's uh, some ongoing and future research directions are, how can we leverage these learned forward kinodynamic uh, functions or inverse kinodynamic functions to improve offline racing line optimization? So we spoke a little bit about this earlier. Um, how can we perform arbitrary object optimization, objective optimization using learned forward kinodynamic models? And, the idea is that so far we've been using IKD models and the IKD models require a racing line, which uh, is optimized using some objective function. These objective functions actually can change based on your mission uh, requirements. So maybe you want to have, uh, you have one mission where you want to be as quick as possible. Another one you want to be as stealthy as possible. And uh, for different objectives, currently if you're only doing IKD, you would need to uh, learn or relearn a different IKD model. However, you could in fact think about having uh, a single forward kinodynamic model be used to optimize for different objectives during rollouts. Okay. Um, how can you reason about risk and reward for different mission profiles? And this relates to the fact that so far, we've actually thought about inverse kinodynamics or forward kinodynamics as the most likely outcome. Okay. But it turns out that the places that the kinds of environments that we're testing them, it's actually not true that there's a single possible outcome. It's actually a probabilistic set of outcomes, right? And uh, sometimes this probabilistic distribution is wide and sometimes it's narrow. On concrete, it's actually reasonably narrow because it's very well behaved. On things like gravel and, and dirt, it can be quite wide and the uncertainty is quite high. So how can you reason about risk and reward where sometimes you want to have a mission where you want to have high reliability and not hit any, uh, any obstacles or something, but sometimes you want to actually just say the robot take risks and be, and reach the goal as quickly as possible, right? And uh, you want to do this risk reward analysis. Um, and finally, how can you perform joint high speed perception and control? So a big challenge that we face with these off-road uh, domains is that uh, there's almost no state-of-the-art perception algorithm which can keep up with the speeds of these robots. We're really pushing the limits of what we can do autonomously in, in terms of perception. And we need better approaches to them. And part of that is like, here, let me go back to this video. You'll understand why. Uh, look at all the observations that, the, that this truck has. It has like this vegetation. Uh, it has uh, uh, trees. And uh, okay, in this case, it's close to like that, uh, that particular... Um, building there, but uh, you know, it doesn't really see much structured information. So it's actually a really hard problem. And while it's moving at high speeds, the entire platform of the, on the car is like tilting and rotating. Um, and it's very hard to keep up. Um, so we really need to do a lot more work in high speed perception. Okay. okay. Um, that's basically all I wanted to talk about today, but uh, we can open it up to questions and discussions and we can maybe even brainstorm project ideas if you guys are up for it. Sorry, Rahul, you're muted. If someone's trying to say something. Okay, sorry, I think you didn't hear what I said. Let's give Jaydeep a big hand. So like, guys, okay. let's do that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks, thanks, it was great. Oh, yeah, thanks for letting me know. So, so I think, yeah, I mean, so we can take a couple of questions and what I'd like to do is, uh, since today your project uh, proposals were due, um, each team just also come up and just summarize, you know, what we are doing for your project, right? 
and, and that's a good way to uh, brainstorm uh, question uh, the uh, ideas also over here. Cool. So, uh, yeah. 